Praise the Lord, everyone. Tonight we're finishing up the lukewarm say we got about eight scriptures and this is part eight so we'll be finished tonight um, if you would turn with me to the book of revelations chapter eight and verse number three one of the things that we are striving to do is to make it to heaven I cannot for the life of me understand what the point of all of this would be. Going through what we have gone through, sacrificing, self-discipline, just to go to hell. I, I think about something that um, Sister Lori said in her message Sunday. I don't want to suffer now. I don't want to suffer at the hands of the devil just to go to hell and suffer with him. Uh, that, that's not my thing at all. And so, if we're going to make it to heaven, then we need to be found doing what God expects from us. Yes, ma'am. Chapter 3. In verse 18. Yeah. 3. Revelations chapter 3 and verse 18. And um, uh, someone told me today that I never answered the question last night. So let me just start off by answering the question, then we get into Bible class. Um, in the eyes of man, you would be guilty of theft. In the eyes of God, you would not be because God judges us by our intent. So both sides were right to an extent. Sister Ashley was right. It's black and white. They don't care about nothing else. You took it. You didn't pay for it. You stole it. And you can go down declaring your innocence. And if they feel like it, they'll prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. But that doesn't mean that God sees it that way. Because thankfully, the Lord judges us by the intent of our heart. That's a two-edged sword. God will judge you by the intent of your heart. You can do some good stuff, and God still judge you by the intent of your heart, and what your behavior was was good, but your intent was bad. And God punish you for that. So we just we need to make sure that we keep ourselves clean and spotless before God. In Revelations chapter 3 and verse number 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. clothed. And that's where we left off last week was the white raiment, that we might be clothed, which is our right living. But you can't live right if you don't know what right is. You might hit and miss and get something right. The Apostle Paul talked about this a little bit he said when the when the Gentiles behave themselves uh, when they do right they have a law unto themselves but it wasn't God's law they just did right because it was a moral thing to do they weren't just obeying God and there are people that live their entire lives that never steal and never kill but they just hitting and missing The last part is that the shame or, or that uh, anoint. Well, that's part of where we left off last week, that the shame of thy nakedness uh, do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So if we're going to be found pleasing to God, we need to see what it is that God 
wants from us. And we can't do that without the Holy Ghost enlightening our eyes. And this is what he's talking about here. It is possible for someone to be filled with the Holy Ghost and for the light to slowly go dim on them so that they can no longer see what it is that God is expecting in their life. I used this example before. I can remember one time I was reading and it was in the evening time and I wasn't really paying attention. I was just sitting and reading my Bible and without even realizing it, I was struggling to read because the sun was going down. It wasn't until my wife walked in and flipped the light on that I realized just how dark it had gotten. That's what happens to people when they slowly drift away from God. The light is slowly going out and it happens so gradual that you're really not paying attention. We can find ourselves back in darkness and not even realize that's where we are. Uh, in Psalm number 19, in verses 7 through 9, Psalm number 19, verses 7 through 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So let's just go back and, and look at what he's saying. The law of the Lord is perfect. There are times when, and you can tell when someone is slowly starting to drift away because you can quote the Bible to them and they still won't accept it. You can see sometimes they're struggling to accept it. You can show them black and white in the Bible. It says, thou shall not whatever and they will say but what if and start to pull apart the word of God now I try to be very careful I don't I don't uh, come up with rules just to be having rules I don't come up with things just to say that this church has rules that we follow we do but I don't do that I don't just sit down and say, well, you know what? These, these, uh, these blue shirts just don't look right. So from now on, we don't wear blue shirts in the church. Well, that, that's silly. And if someone was to come and ask me, why don't we wear blue shirts? And I don't have any Bible, then generally my response will be either because I said so or uh, well, are you trying to challenge the church? You, you trying to challenge the word of God? I like to have some word to back me up. If I'm going to say you're wrong for something, it needs to come from the Bible. Where do we find understanding and truth? In the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converts the soul. We know that being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost makes us new creatures. We know that. But what converts us? Obedience to the word of the Lord, to his law, to what he says. That is what changes us. When you first get the Holy Ghost, you don't know everything. There's a lot of stuff you don't know. And so you have to be taught from the word of the Lord. What is that doing? Converting you. 
And I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about being converted. And we will be converted until we die. Because we will never achieve all that God wants us to be. We can keep striving for perfection. And the, the Bible says it like this. Building up your most holy faith. You don't ever get finished building up your faith. You never get finished building up your walk with God. There's always more that we can do. And God will judge us based on what we know and what we did. So, if I can use Brother Delshawn for an example. He may know three steps. And I know seven. And I walk three steps and say, well, if that's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. No, that's not the way God works. If he's expecting seven steps from me, then that's what I need to give him. Do we have any scriptures that, that back up what I just said? He said, to whom much is given, much is required. That's good, but we got something else too. Yes, sir. Yes. It's the parable that Jesus used. Some he gave 30, some 60, some 100. The one that got the 30, God's not looking for 100 or 60 from them. He's not even looking for 31 from them. But the one he gave 60, he's not looking for 45 or 50. He's not even looking for 59. He's looking for 60. Everyone has been given a measure of faith. That's what the Bible tells us. Under every man was given a measure of faith. Not everyone has the same measure. Not everyone is expected the same from God. So how do I know what God wants from me? I got to know his word. Yes, ma'am. Yes, she said, what I'm saying is that not everyone is at the same level, but everyone is at different levels, and we're all learning. That's true. That's exactly what it is. We're not all at the same level, and we can get in trouble when we try to measure our walk with God based on someone else. That's not the rule that God gave us. He says it right here, the law of the Lord is perfect. Because you might be following someone that's doing 60 and think that you're really achieving something and God is expecting 100 from you. You may be following someone that's doing 60 and God's expecting 100 from them, but not from you. You find yourself messed up. There are some folks that walk away from God because they feel like they're not doing enough. They give up because they feel like, well, I should be doing more. And so after a while, they just stop, they give up, and they walk away. And why do they feel like that? The ones that I have talked to almost all have the same answer. Well, I saw brother so-and-so, I saw sister so-and-so, and I wasn't doing like them. Wrong ruler altogether. When I was in high school, we used to, uh, I was a draftsman in high school. I was, took all the drafting classes, mechanical and um, architectural drafting. I took drafting in college. I took drafting at a trade school. I was intending to be a draftsman. And we had a three-sided ruler that we used to use. And each one of those edges had a different scale of measurement. Yes, sir. A draft. <laughs> he said, "What's a draftsman? Um, a draftsman is someone that draws blueprints for something. So if you're going to build a house, you have to have blueprints for it. If you're going to make something, um, just like that, there has to be a print or something that it, it follows. A draftsman does that. Toys, anything, anything that has to be made, almost always follows blueprints." and blueprints are made by draftsmen. We had scales, and there were times when I would get to a certain portion on my sheet and realize what it was I was drawing was going to go off the edge. And I was, well, what? How? 
how am I going off the edge of my paper? And I know that I'm doing exactly, I'm, I'm measuring everything right. Come to find out I had the wrong scale. So I'd have to get a new sheet, flip my ruler, and start using the correct scale. People do this in their walk with God. If you use the wrong scale, you'll find yourself out of bounds. You'll find yourself off in your walk with God because you're using the wrong scale. What is the right scale? The law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is his word, the Bible. This. The whole thing. Not just the New Testament. I wish I could remember that preacher's name that told me he was a member of a church in, in Lansing, East Lansing, or Lansing, Michigan. When I was going to Michigan State, we would Elder Warren would come and have the van come and pick us up and take us to church. And this, this preacher was our Sunday school teacher. And he would say, if it ain't in red print, I don't believe it. He only believed in what Jesus said. That was it. He didn't understand that Jesus was the word, black and red. He was all of it. We used to think it was funny. But if you want to be saved, you got to believe the red you got to believe the black, the new, and the old. You got to believe it all. We have to, all of it is given for us so that we can know not just how to live, but we can see the mistakes that others have made. For a long time, I had the mindset of they just didn't know what they were doing. I can do the same thing and make it work. And I'd crash and burn just like they did. If anybody, if anyone in here has ever been a child, I'm sure you have had the same philosophy. Because mom or daddy said, don't do whatever, because this is what's going to happen, it's going to be bad. And they end up doing it anyway. You know why? Because they felt like, for whatever reason, they knew how to make it work. I used to think my parents were dumb until I got older. Then I realized, um, as Mark Twain said it, the older I got, the wiser they became. <laughs> some people, some people never learn from other people's mistakes. You know where you usually see that at? In jails. Yep, yeah, they're sitting there and they're, well, you know, the mistake that you made was when you broke the glass, you didn't have gloves on. But if you have on gloves, then they can't get your fingerprints, and they would have never caught you. Well, if you know how to break the law without getting caught, why are you in jail? They're giving bad advice to people who don't know how to do with good advice. It never works. Never. So the thing is, learn from somebody's mistakes. Amen, anybody? Amen. I've seen folks on YouTube getting beat up by the police. You know what their mistake was? Believe in somebody else's video that said, the police don't have a right to do this. You don't know what the police have a right to do and don't do. And just because you saw it on the internet doesn't mean that they're right. Amen. And, and this is something that really people don't get, each state has its own laws. I know a police officer that did something to someone, and they said, huh, he ain't had no right to do that. I'm suing. He snatched them up out their car, did some, some damage. Come to find out, the police was right. The law supported them. It wasn't just that they were backing the police. The police, would, he had the right to do that because they violated the law of this state. So, it's important to make sure that we know where we're getting our information from. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Does anybody know what a testimony is? Nobody knows? It's not a trick question, y'all. Everybody's scared. Huh? She said something that you've overcome. 
an experience, a testimony. Yes, ma'am. Something that's been a witness to. A testimony is something that a person says based on knowledge they have. So like something, what did you say? So something that you've overcome. If you overcome something, then you give a testimony about what it was that you overcame. That is your testimony. The overcoming isn't the testimony. You telling people about it is the testimony. So the testimony of the Lord is sure. What God says is sure. It'll take someone that doesn't have good sense and help them have good sense. If I can give you a, a quick example, you walk in and you see two folks arguing with each other. And you decide, the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. I'm going to get this thing settled down. I'm going I'm to bring some peace in here. Because they don't need to be arguing like that. So you just jump right in the middle of the argument and you're going to get it settled down. Well, if you know the law of the Lord, if you know the testimony of the Lord, it says that anybody that just jumps into an argument as they're walking by is like taking a dog by his ears. You know what a dog will do if you grab him by his ears? Say, what? Now, well, I, think, I think we got 100% consensus on that one. He'll bite you. What do you think is going to happen to you if you just jump into an argument with someone? But if you know the testimony of the Lord, if you know the law of the Lord, then you'll know better than to jump into an argument that's none of your business. You'll have one scripture that says, blessed is the peacemakers, and another one that says, don't do it. It'll be like grabbing a dog by his ears. Now, that's up to you. But if you know what the Bible says, the best thing to do is to obey it, right? All right, now, I, know, I don't know anybody that's done that, but maybe tomorrow you might run into two folks arguing. Keep Walk on by. <laughs> Keep on going. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. A statute, a statute is a rule. The statutes of the Lord are right. God does not come up with rules just to make up rules. If anybody could do this, it would be God. If anybody could say, I'm going to make up this rule that you can't wear black shoes on Sunday just because I'm God and I say so. He could do that, couldn't he? Yes. But he doesn't even do that. God doesn't come up with anything just randomly. Every single law that he has for us to not do is to keep us from being hurt. Do children understand that? When I was a child, we used to, uh, we used to sneak down by the railroad tracks and put nickels on the tracks because somebody said that if you put a nickel on the railroad track, you'll derail the train. <laughs> So we were determined that we was going to derail a train. So we would put the nickel on the track, and we'd run and hide, just waiting for the, the, the train to fall off the tracks. Never happened. Should have kept it. You're right. When we, when we realized that nickels weren't working, we would put rocks on there. just as dumb I don't, either the train would knock it off the edge of the track or it just crush it but by the time the train went by there was nothing left not even powder not even a nickel it was all gone we need to understand how to follow the rules that God laid down because God doesn't give us rules just because our parents told us, stay away from them tracks. Was it just because they was adults and they could say so? No, because if the train did derail, we, we couldn't have got away fast enough. 
They, our parents told us, stay away from the street. When you five, six years old, you don't know what being hit by a car means. Seven years old, you don't understand what that is. And unless you've ever seen it, you have to guess at the age of 10, 12, 13 years old. If you've never seen someone get hit by a car, you can only speculate. You can only guess what it's going to do to you if you get hit by it. I can tell you, unless you've ever been hit, you can't even guess what it'll do to you. Moving slow. I've been bumped by cars going less than five miles an hour, and I knew I had been bumped. I wasn't expecting it. I can't imagine what it would be like 25 or 30 miles an hour. The statutes of the Lord are right. So why do people then come and say, I don't see anything wrong with that? Why can't I? Do you know why they do that? Because they don't believe that God is right. Well, I guess I'll move on because that, 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 that drew nothing. Not even a head shake. The statutes of the Lord are right. And when you understand that they're right, what does it do? Makes your heart rejoice. You understand that God's laws, his statutes are not just out there, but God is doing it to protect me. Now that I'm grown, I've told many a person, I'm glad I got spankings when I was a kid. Had I not got them, I'd have been really, really bad. I'm glad. I didn't like it when I was getting them. But now that I understand why and what it did, I'm happy. I'm glad that my parents did that. At the time, if, if, if one of them would have got a beat down their own self, I'd have stood and watched and, and grinned because I didn't understand. But now I know now I know what it did, how it changed me. Someone, someone just said something to me the other day, or, or it wasn't the other day, but a while ago. I, I said, they asked me a question, and I said, uh, sir? They're like, oh, you don't have to call me, sir. You grown. I said, this is just an ingrained, ingrained habit. That's the way I was raised. It put it in. They, my parents put that in me. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Their name wasn't what? My grandmother only had to get me once over that, about her name not being what. And you didn't stay in the living room to see what they had to say. You got up and went out to see what they wanted. So when your name got called, it was, yes, ma'am. And you was making way over there. Now, this ain't a parenting class. I'm just saying that's the way we were raised. And if you didn't do it, you got a whooping. I got smart with my grandmother one time without even realizing I was, I was getting smart. I didn't even know it. She had some rice and, and wanted me to eat all of my rice that was on the plate. And I was full. And she said, there are children starving in China. I said, well, why don't we box it up and send it to them? <laughs> Y'all right. It was oh no. And my, my head whew, from getting slapped. She about put my forehead on the t on the kitchen table. Hit me so hard. You think I ever talked again without thinking about what I was saying? Oh no. Not unless I was a good distance off. But I knew even then, if they said, come on over here. I'm going to get a weapon. All of that did something to me. It wasn't bad. It was for my good. When God gets us, when he has all these rules, it's not to punish us. It's not to make us not have. It's to protect us. He goes a little bit further. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Doing what? Enlightening the eyes. Now, how do I see? 
by understanding the commandments of the Lord. Now I can see what it is that God is saying. When you read your Bible and you find out the mistakes that some of the children of Israel made, you can learn from their mistakes and not do the same ones. It enlightens your eyes to see what God said. God commanded them to do something and they disobeyed it. It's enlightening to your eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. When he says fear, he doesn't mean scared. He means respect. The respect of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, righteous and righteous altogether. How many in here are glad that God's judgments are righteous? I am. It's going to be a whole lot of folks someday that's going to be sorry that his judgments are righteous, that God's judgments are right. They will be very sorry. You know why? Because they've spent their whole lives or a portion of their lives trying to justify their walk with God, not learning his commandments, not learning his statutes, not learning his ways, not learning his word. They spent their time saying, well, the way I see it is, and then make up something. And then they try to persuade God that's what it is. But the judgments of God are righteous. He's not making mistakes. And he's not persuaded. He's not bullied. You can't offer him anything to make him disobey or to go back on his word. Nothing you can offer God. In the book of Ephesians chapter 1, <coughs> Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 17. Let the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Now this is what Paul is asking for, for the church. That the spirit, that the Lord give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of of him in the knowledge of who in the knowledge of God the more I know about God the easier my walk with God is my parents had a lot of rules for me when I was a child had I understood why those rules were there it would have been easy to follow them I didn't understand why we weren't allowed to cross over the railroad ties in the front yard but on the other side of those railroad ties was a highway. It just seemed like rules. Had I understood the danger of being on a highway, then staying on this side of the railroad ties wouldn't have seemed like such a bad thing after all. It is the revelation of the knowledge of him Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So that my, my eyes might be opened. We're talking about the eye salve, right? That we should have eye salve on our eyes. That's what the Holy Ghost does for us. The Holy Ghost gives us an enlightenment, allows us to see. That's what the word enlightened means, to have light put on something so that you can see it. Second Peter. Chapter 1 and verse 5. Now, at any point in this list, if you don't know what a word means, stop me and I'll tell you what it is. Or after we're finished with the list, 
Just put up your hand and I'll give you the definition. There's a lot of words in here. Some of them you may know, you may not know, but if you want clarification, I can give it to you. Verses 5 through 9. First Peter or Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 5 through 9. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these be in you and abound, they make you that you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now he starts off with this, and besides this, besides what? Verse four whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these or by these promises ye may be partakers of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust we were given exceeding great and precious promises by God what are those promises that we could live a life of holiness that we will be his bride, that if we are remain faithful and holy, that we will be able to go to heaven, that we will be with him throughout eternity. World without end is the way I think Peter puts it. World without end. We will have everything, that we will no longer have sorrows or grief or problems, no more hunger, no more crying, no more anything, no more pestilence and disease, no more aches and pains, all of this will be gone away. That is the exceeding great and precious promises that he has given us. But he said, don't stop with just the promise. Give all diligence. Add to your faith. I've got to add to my faith. I cannot just be satisfied with what I have. I have to build up my faith. And add to my faith virtue. To virtue and knowledge. And he goes on and he gives this entire list of all of these things. Why? He gives us all of these things in verse 8. For if these things be in you. This is the part that we don't care for. And abound. Does anybody know what the word abound means? To go above. Yes, to go above and beyond. If these things be in you, if faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, if these be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in your job. No, in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. How can I have knowledge? This goes beyond just reading the Bible. I have to live the Bible. It goes beyond God just opening my eyes. I have to put it in practice. And not just sometimes. I have to abound in it. It has to be so deep in me that I always do what God wants and some. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He that lacketh these things are blind, but not blind like you would normally think because he goes on and says, and cannot see afar off. So it's not that you can't see at all. What is a person that cannot see far off? That's someone that can only see up close, right? 
you say nearsighted? I don't know. I thought they was the opposite. If you're far, so if you're nearsighted, you can only see things that are far away, or you know what? <laughs> no, okay, I take your word for it. I don't know. She said you can only see things that are close to you when you're nearsighted. Uh, you know what a nearsighted person can see? Does anybody have any idea what a nearsighted person can see? Things close to you. Well, well, yes, things close to you. I know that. What's close to you? You. <laughs> a nearsighted a person that can't see afar off can only see their self. When we are un fruitful in the knowledge of God all we can see is my side the way I feel the way I see it when you come across somebody and you give them the word and their answer is but they did this to me what are they what are they saying I'm nearsighted I can't see afar off I can only see me uh, can I say this I had a saint do something one time and I told them what you have done is wrong you need to go back and restore what it is that you did wrong a year later um, they came to me and told me someone had restored what they had done themselves they just did it and they was mad and I said but I told you a year ago to fix that well then they started listing off all the things that the person had done to them and why they wasn't going to do it you know what that is I can't see afar off all I can see is me I can't see what God's word says I can't see that what I need to do is what the Bible says do that if my brother asks for my coat give him my cloak also there is no Give him thy cloak unless he owes you money. It doesn't say that. All right, let's go on. Romans chapter 3. I had a saint tell me one time when God saved me, he didn't save me from a lot because I really wasn't doing anything. All right, how about this? Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Who's going to stand before God and say, I really hadn't done that much? You know what he's interested in? Your righteousness. Is it self-righteousness or his righteousness? It's got to be his righteousness. I don't know how to live right without him. If I'm living right based on me, then I can say things like, I really wasn't doing that much. But there's none righteous. No, not one. Not your grandma, not your grandpa, not your mom, not your dad, not your siblings. There's none righteous. No, not one. If, if they don't have the Holy Ghost, they're not righteous. Is, is that too complicated, saints? Psalm 130 and verse 3. If the Lord should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If God was to mark, if God was to point his finger at what's wrong in our lives, who would be able to stand up right before God? Consider this. The Lord said about Job, he's perfect and upright and he fears God and he hates evil. That's what God said about him. Perfect, upright, fears God, hates evil. But when God started to mark iniquity, could Job stand? Nope. Even though he was perfect, even though 
he was upright even though he loved the Lord even though he hated evil there's none righteous no not one not even brother Job and when God starts to mark iniquity you better hope you got the Holy Ghost you better hope that you live in it Galatians chapter 2 and verse 18 for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Transgressor. If I build again the things which I destroyed, what things are he talking about? Is, is uh, Paul talking about when he wrote this to the churches of Galatia? If I build again, when was something destroyed in their life? When you got the Holy Ghost. God destroyed the yoke. Didn't know what the scripture tells us? If I go back and start putting that yoke back together again, and some people do that, they will get the Holy Ghost and God will convict them and then after a while, the Lord will unconvict them. And they'll start going back into the things that they used to do before they got saved. He said, if I build those things again, I make myself a transgressor. I make myself someone that goes against the law of God. We're not talking about foolish things. When somebody gets the Holy Ghost and they say, well, you know, the Lord saved me. I'm so glad that the Lord saved me. And he has convicted me that I don't eat uh, ham and cheese sandwiches anymore. That's, that's not him delivering you from sin. That's just something you thought. The sinful things in your life the things that God delivered you from that you were doing that he was not pleased with. If you go back and start doing those things again, you make yourself a transgressor. You make yourself disobedient to the things of God. So when God saved me and took me out of the house of my girlfriend, do y'all? does anybody here remember Moses Dickens, Elder Moses Dickens. Does anybody remember him? Yeah, that, that, that was a preaching brother. Pardon me? Yep. No, he was from South Haven, All Nations Pentecostal Church in South Haven. That was Sister Mobley's brother. I remember him saying he went to church one night, got convicted, went up and got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, went home, packed his bags and his girlfriend said where are you going he said God has filled me with the Holy Ghost I'm not, I can't stay here no more now what if after he had had the Holy Ghost for six months he said well I'm just visiting her we, we just good old friends what's he starting to do build up those things which had already been destroyed if you liked drinking and all your buddies used to drink and God saved you and you come away from it and then you start to slowly hang around with them again, I'm building back up those things that I destroyed. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> she said, uh, when, he, when he used to come here, he used, he used to always sing, I can't keep it to myself. Was that him or was that him? All right. That brother could preach. I enjoyed him. If we go back and undo what God delivered us from, we are wrong. In Revelations chapter 3 and 19, it says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. When we find ourselves drifting away from God, then the only thing I can do is repent. Isaiah chapter 58. Verses 1 and 2 and then 13 and 14. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily 
and delight to know my ways as a nation that did uh, righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me ordinances of doing thy pleasure. I'm sorry, they ask of me uh, they ask of me of justice that they take delight in approaching unto God. What are they doing? They're hypocriting. God's not sending Isaiah to them because this is what they're doing. He's sending Isaiah to them because this is what they're pretending to be doing. They seek me daily and delight to know my ways. They, they act like this is what they want as a nation that see when he said as that means this is what they're acting like they're acting as a nation that did not or that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God that's what they act like this is this is a huge problem in churches today people that act like they're right People that act like they're saved. They act like they've forsaken the world. They act like they're, they're going after God and his ordinances and his commandments. I just want to do what God wants me to do. And go right out and do what they want to do. I, I just want to sit and listen to Bible class so I can see what it is that God wants. The whole time I'm doing wrong. God knows the difference. And then he goes on in verse 13. He deals with their wrong and then says, this is the cure, this is the fix. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing pleasure, doing thy pleasure. So if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day if you stop doing what it is that you like and come to church when you're supposed to come to church and call the Sabbath a delight some folks come to church on Sunday already trying to hurry up how long, how, how long is this going to take they come in like that. Do, don't do your pleasure on the Sabbath and call coming to church a delight. Sometimes you got to just keep saying it till you feel it. I'm glad to come to church. I'm glad to come to church. You keep telling yourself, I'm glad to come to church. Because here's the thing. If you call the Sabbath a delight and don't do your own thing when it's time to go to church, then God's going to do something for you. He goes on a little bit further, though. If you call the holy of the Lord honorable and thou shalt honor him. Let's see, who's he talking about there? No guesses, huh? Y'all, that's scared. Who's the honorable? Um, who's the holy of the Lord? The saints. Come on, you can get a little closer than that, though. The preacher. See, some folks come to church. Oh, I'm glad to go to church, but I don't want to hear what the, what the pastor's preaching today. I don't got no time for that. I'm not making this up. This is in the Bible. If you call the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him. that See, here's what we'll do. And this is the reason why I've said this all along. This is the reason why I don't want no pastor's anniversaries. Because I don't want nobody getting up and lying. Some folks will get up, I just love the pastor. <laughs> lying through their teeth. I'm not interested in that. You want to honor the pastor? Be obedient to the word. Yeah. Honor the man of God and not do your own ways. 
nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Ain't that strong? I come to church. I'm not trying to find my own pleasure. I'm not trying to walk in my own way. I'm not speaking my own ideas. That is a real problem today. People want to come to church and the way I see it, the way I think it ought to be, the way I heard what the preacher said, but I ain't going for that. What are you doing? Speaking your own words, isn't it? If you can do that, then, verse 14, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, if God spoke it, what is that? Is that a testimony? Testimony of the Lord? I said it. If you can get your attitude right about church, if you can get your attitude right about the preacher, if you can get your attitude right about the word, then you can delight yourself in the Lord. There's another scripture in the book of Psalms that delight thyself in the Lord. Does anybody know how that go? Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires that ah, he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. And here he tells us how we can delight in the Lord. I've had folks come and ask me, well, how do you delight in the Lord? I, I don't know how to delight in him. Well, I do it by showing respect and honor to his house, to his man, to his word, to his ministry. I do that then. I'll delight myself in the Lord. Then he'll cause me to ride on high places. Nobody wants to ride on high places. Nobody. Nobody wants to be fed God's heritage. Nobody wants anything like that. I got somebody giggling. This is what it takes. You keep watching people on TV. You keep looking at videos on YouTube. You keep reading what other folks have to say on the internet about church and about God and about preachers. You keep doing that and you'll poison your own self out of blessings from God. I know somebody, I'm going to say this and I'm going to be finished. I know someone that was talking to this lady and she she was complaining about her husband and she kept on complaining this lady kept listening to her and I wouldn't take that off of him I wouldn't do this that and the other you know yeah he's no good he's low down you ought to get rid of him kick him to the side I wouldn't take it. After a while, she finally worked up enough nerve to leave him. And the next thing you know, the woman that talked her into leaving him took him. <laughs> no, somebody said that's dirty. No, it's not. You ought to recognize what you got. You ought to appreciate what you have. Don't let people talk you out of... Christ Temple Church is a good church. We love each other. We get along with each other. We like a family. Wow. I love this place. I do. I don't know any place else I want to be than right here. I love the ministry in this place. Our preachers... I think are better than all other preachers. We have a tremendous church. I get compliments in the street all the time about this church. Somebody just told me the other day, it looked like the saints is really being obedient to the word. They are really doing well, young and old. Everybody's doing good. Now, I know we have our little 
kind of nibbing going on here and there because that's just human nature. And we have to, we have to fight, not fighting each other. But you come in here, there's no, I can remember when, if depending on what side of the church you was, folks on the other side wouldn't speak to you. And that was in this church. I remember that. You, you had to pick the right side. And it depended on who was sitting on that side that determined which was the right side. So if they sat on this side of the church, everybody that came in better sit on that side. If they sat on this side, then you better sit on this side. Because if you sat on that side and they were over here, that's because you was against them. Oh, there was a huge contention going on. We don't have nothing like that. Nothing. We get along well with each other. Old, young, rich, poor, black, white, Hispanic, all of us. Amen. Folks dress good, folks that don't dress good. Folks that look pretty, folks that look prettier. <laughs> we all get along. I tell folks that all the time. I'm, I'm grateful for the church that God allowed me to pastor. Because I don't have to deal with the headaches a lot of these other preachers are dealing with. Folks trying to take over, folks trying to get them shut down, folks trying to cause problems, cutting off their tithes and offerings and, and calling the law on them and all kind of stuff. I'm glad that we don't have to deal with any of that stuff here. Don't let nobody talk you out of what you have. Sometimes you can be so into you that you don't realize when you have something good. This is a good place. Amen. I'm not just saying that because I'm the pastor. I'm saying it because I feel it here. I mean, this is a place of love. All right. Any questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. Um, her question is dealing with um, the different levels that people have, the 30, the 60, and the 100-fold. And she, the question is, what do you do with that? There... When you have an ability to do something for God and you don't do it, that's when you're in trouble. It doesn't mean that you have to be at the church every single day doing something. It means that when you have an ability given by God, you use that ability for God. So there are some, for example, myself, if you don't give me a calculator, I'm not going to get five or six numbers added up together correctly. And if you give me the calculator, I still might get them wrong. I used to do my checkbook, and after bouncing checks a couple of times because I miscalculated or double-added numbers that wasn't supposed to be there, I had turned over to my wife. She had an ability that I didn't have. So I'm using that as a natural example, but that's the same thing that works in the church. There are some who have talents that have abilities in the church, and they just sit and won't do anything. Well, if they don't ask me, I ain't going to do it. We should be doing what we know to do. So if I have an ability to run a vacuum sweeper, let's say that's my gift. I really know how to run vacuums. Well, then I should come to the church and say, hey, can I run a vacuum too? Because I'm pretty good at running a vacuum. That's part of my 30 or my 60 or my 100. Some people are very talented with things. And we should be using it when we are asked or when we know that if there's a need, we should be using it for the edifying of God's house and his people. I hope that clears it up. I mean, there, I don't know how to give an example other than I don't know. She said she had someone tell her at one time that when the disciples died, the gifts died. Well, if the gifts died, then the giver died too. He's still giving. He is. There are people, and if I could use an, a, an example from the Bible about what you just said, it's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a, um, he was a gifted man. He was, he was already brilliant before he got the Holy Ghost. So even without the Holy Ghost, he was a very brilliant man. After God gave him the Holy Ghost, he took it up another level. God added on to that. He took what he already had as a natural talent 
and gifted him too. So there are people who are born with natural talents. And when you get the Holy Ghost, if God gifts you along with that, you are out of sight. And if you're not careful, you would get a hold of your head and make you think you're better than somebody. Because once God gives a gift, you got it. You really do. Yes, Sister Betty, you, you've had your... Oh, I, th I thought you had raised your hand just to... You did. You just forgot. You said. Maybe you were saying, can we go? <laughs> if you have... If you see someone at the church... If you know that you have an ability to encourage people and you don't use that ability to encourage God's people, that's taking what he has given you and wasting it. Some people are good encouragers. Some people are good instructors. So you're, you're an excellent in instructor. You train people at work, but you don't want to be a Sunday school teacher. And it's something that you have natural, a talent that you have natural. Why, why would you waste it? Why not use it for God too? Amen. Anything else? I hope that answered your question. Best I can. Anything else? Stand on your feet.